projects, whether it's cleaning up a brownfield, uh, bringing back a building that's completely offline, um, you know, just blighted areas in general are kind of where we shine. Nonprofits are a real sweet spot for us because we offer what's known as tax exempt bonds, which I won't get into the details of, but it really is just a, a loan with a bow wrapped around it that makes the, the cost of, of getting that money much less expensive. So banks are our partners. I also work with this great team today um, as kind of the team Massachusetts, where we work with companies both in state and out of state uh, to bring them to Massachusetts, to help them grow in Massachusetts and kind of You'll hear about that from a few of us, but we were lucky enough to, to meet Sandia during that time, and she was a great partner. We did a lot of uh, lead generation together as a team. So a little bit of everything. So that's kind of mass development. We're here to look for, to finance capital projects, equipment, and real estate, um, work with communities on a variety of grant programs to help them uh, develop real estate. And we take on real estate projects ourselves, such as big things like Devon's. Devon's is a project of ours that we own and manage and lease and sell space. Fantastic, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, all right, so let's, um, Kevin and, and I'll, I'll bring Peter in at the same time. I'm gonna skip a, just a bit um, in alphabetical order, but since you guys are in the same office, let's, uh, let's hear what, what the Mass Office of Business Development does. Oh, sorry, and I didn't unmute you guys, so sorry. Go ahead, Kevin, you got it. Okay, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin Kuros. I'm one of six uh, regional directors uh, for the Mass Office of Business Development. I've got responsibility uh, primarily for uh, Central Mass, but we all overlap and, and help cover each other's districts um, as needed. Um, MOBD, for those of you who are not familiar with the organization, we are uh, the state's executive branch um, econo economic development uh, organization. So um, our primary responsibility uh, in normal times uh, is, is to administer the Economic Development Incentive Program, which is uh, the state's you know, uh, premier uh, economic development program. And, and through, the, through the EDIP, uh, businesses can uh, seek uh, relief on both their local property tax uh, through the use of TIFs in working with uh, the, the community, the host community, um, or, or and they can also, uh, if they do receive a TIF, uh, can seek relief from their corporate tax liability as well um, through the program. So, so that in a normal state, that's you know that's what we do. Um, for since March, um, we've been uh, working, you know, quite a bit with businesses. Uh, initially to understand, um, help them understand if they uh, fell under the category of essential businesses or not. That was the big question initially. And then over the past couple uh, phases of the reopening, uh, we get a lot of questions because, you know, it's not all cut and dry. There are a lot of nuances to um, every business uh, being different. And, and so we, we've been a resource for a lot of businesses to help them determine how best they are to um, the best able to take advantage of you know the opportunity to reopen so so uh, that's kind of what we do on a on a firefighting basis um the other thing that i will share and i'll and then invite peter to to you know talk about whatever he feels would would be important here as well is that you know part of what um we do and and we report uh to secretary uh mike Canelli, secretary of housing and economic development um as you all are probably aware um Every you know, four years when a new administration uh, is elected, they are required to file uh, an economic development plan, which you know, the governor uh, works with the secretary, so the, the, the whole cabinet, but you know, you know, especially Secretary uh, Keneally, who has economic development, to develop the plan. And just to give you a sense for the timeline for what transpired here, uh, you know, it was the, the plan was adopted uh, in, I believe, October, November, uh, and then, you know, as a follow on to that, in order to put the plan into action, a, a bill is introduced that has actionable items with funding and different programs. Well, that bill was introduced. I'm looking at some dates now. March 4th, the bill was filed uh, with the legislature. And March 10th, uh, the state of emergency was declared in the Commonwealth. 
So, um, you know, this is not exactly textbook as far as the way this is supposed to work, but uh, just uh, as, as a way of, of background, and, and I have a very small slide set that, that I'll, I'll send to Aaron, and, and you're welcome to, to, to share it with the group here. There were a number of changes. Uh, you know, the choice was either to just run with the economic development bill um, as it was drafted, um, or to adjust um, as appropriate, depending on what we saw coming out of the, out of the pandemic. And a couple of things that we saw, you know, were that, um, you know, uh, communities of color were particularly hard hit. And so some funding uh, items were adjusted uh, in the bill uh, to reflect that. Um, additional money uh, was put in for the CDFI uh, Small Business Lending Program to help uh, small businesses uh, get through uh, the pandemic. And then um, a, a program called Biz Empower, uh, which um, Mass Growth Capital, I'm sure we'll be talking about in a minute, um, we also saw funding increase dramatically from $5 million in the original bill to $15 million to provide additional assistance. So I'm sure Chuck will talk about that a little bit when um, it's his turn to talk. So um, I just wanted, you know, I do have a small uh, summary uh, slide set that I'll send you, Aaron. You're welcome to share it with the group. It sure. just talks about kind of the timeline, what the original plan was, and then how the administration has had to adjust and adapt based on the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Sure. Peter, you want to add anything? I will not add anything because I don't want to have anybody OD on the mass office. <laughs> but I just want to say one thing. We are in phase three, step one of our reopening plan, which um, Kevin um, informed you guys that we've been very integral in a lot of the challenges as they relate back from the business community. Uh, and we've been elevating to the executive office so that we can uh, continue to work. And of note, in phase three, it's called vigilant, and we ask that everyone remain vigilant. But fitness centers, and I know you guys have a, a couple in Lexington, and museums. Uh, so those are those are places that have now been given the uh, green light to operate in the town, amongst many others. There's plenty more, but uh, I just wanted to highlight those two, and I'm looking forward to participating. And uh, yeah, we always wanted that we want to support Sandia. She was a big. Uh, part of our team and a big loss for us, but a big get for Lexington. Oh yeah, we feel very fortunate to, to have her with us. I, you know, and and before I, I absolutely want to hear from Chuck and Colin in a second, but I want to just take a minute to say thank you to all of you because Massachusetts has managed this. I mean, we've had missteps and we've had sure, but we're now a model for the rest of the country. And that's largely due to what you guys have been doing at the executive level. And I, I really thank you for that, that we have been able to reopen safely. And, and the, you know, the combination of the risk assessment and the need to get business back up and running has been well managed. So thank you very much for that. Um, Chuck, tell us, mass growth capital. So Mass Growth Capital is a, another quasi-state finance agency. And unlike real estate development or equipment financing or tax incentive programs, we look to deliver a shot of working capital to small businesses when they've had a hiccup, they've had a transition, they've re-engineered. Whatever case where a senior bank is unable to lend or lend further we will lend in a junior mezzanine position below the bank or underneath its collateral with an intercreditor agreement with the bank. So we work cooperatively with banks. As a matter of fact, we're prohibited from competing with banks. And most of our loans are term loans, but we do have the capability of providing lines of credit, contract manufacturing lines or facilities for specific sudden growth, our mission drives us, and that mission is to help Massachusetts based businesses stay in the state, survive, thrive, and grow jobs in the state. And this past spring, we were privileged to be um, party to an emergency loan fund before the federal government could start to deploy their programs from March 16th until uh, March 20th. We had over 3,000 applications. And we fulfilled about 1,600, where we made three-year loans of up to $75,000. And mass development was a big part of that. 
They participated in funding $20 million with the small business loans. We're proud of that. And even though I've been on vacation this week, it's been in the works that the Mass Empower program, which unlike a loan is a grant program, and it's being uh, facilitated by the towns and cities that are designated under a certain category. Uh, my colleagues here can add a little bit more if they wish to. But right now, federal monies have pretty much been the ideal way for small businesses to get access to funds during this crisis. As a point of going forward, until those monies are fully lent out and until the banks start to get concerned from their regulators about their portfolios, which won't be until the SBA stops making their six months worth of SBA loan payments, um, it's gonna be quiet for us, which is why we're getting involved with the various grant programs to help small businesses that continue to struggle on a smaller scale and may not be able to afford in terms of repayment a loan. But that's a fairly new program. I don't have, I haven't been well versed on all the details of it yet and we're just getting into uh, the administrative implementation of it. Uh, Peter and Kevin would probably know more about the status of that program and its timetable of developments. Okay. Great, thank you. We'll, we'll make sure that we let them answer questions on that when we get there. Um, all right, so Colin, um, you're you're up. Oh, sorry, you are muted, Colin. There you go. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, I'm Colin Proctor. I'm the store manager of the TD Bank here in Lexington. Um, I guess that, that's the day job in terms of just trying to work in the community and help customers meet their needs. Um, I'm also the vice chair of the Lexington Chamber. So I just want to take a second and say thank you, Aaron, uh, for putting not only this together, but everything you've been doing in the last few months, because you, you've really helped put a lot of these programs in place and really gotten some of our businesses in town, um, some of the information they, they desperately need right now. So thank you for that. Um, I guess for this conference call or Zoom call today, um, my specialty area is right now the PPP um, loan program. Um, back in when this whole started, I, I got kind of pulled out of the store to help facilitate people taking the applications. And now we're transitioning into what the forgiveness brought piece of it is going to look like um, when it does happen. I, I know in most cases, most banks aren't taking forgiveness applications yet. We're still waiting on another new law that went into effect last week to get some of the, the rules that came out on that, but I'm here to help with any questions I can on it. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So thank you very much to all of the panelists and um, I'm going to encourage the panelists to stay unmuted, if you will, so you can jump in as we get into questions. Um, as we get into questions, I'm gonna, anyone is welcome to ask a question. Um, if you would like, you can put it in the chat and I'm happy to read it out for you. You're also welcome to kind of signal me that you've got a question I can call on you. Um, but we absolutely, we're ready to, to take some questions. I have a couple to get us started. So as you're thinking of your questions that you wanna ask, I'm gonna throw a couple out there. Um, so the first question that I had, so this has been a huge education process for me. Uh, this was not a world that I came from when I entered this job in April. And it's been a really sharp learning curve. Um, and you know, all of you have been really helpful in that. I have, the thing that has intrigued me the most, um, so I'm gonna ask Chuck about this. The, the calls that we have every Friday afternoon with the, the office of um, the executive office, Secretary Keneally's office. Um, you guys are always on there. Mass Growth Capital is always on there. And I honestly had no idea about all the different programs you guys had. So I've been hearing about beyond, you know, the, the PPP and, and so forth. I've been hearing about your know, micro loans and 704 loans and things like that. What, what are these other programs? Well, if I were to go through the list and the website would serve everyone a little bit better. Sure, yes. But um, 
while we're working capital loan oriented, again, in conjunction with banks, usually in a junior position, um, we are also, and we administer um, a technical assistance grant program that the state funds. Now that is for small businesses that are either in development stage, they need some guidance for marketing, accounting, IT, but it's more of a consulting type nature and it's matching funds where uh, up to, I think it's $25,000, uh, we'll provide half, but the company has to, or it's sponsoring a uh, not-for-profit organization will provide the other 50%, but it's really for business, internal business, business development, you know, business planning, reorganization, business model, pivot, accounting, things that an entrepreneur may think of as essential, but secondary to their main focus so that they can build a better business. Um, that's one program. You mentioned 704. Um, I guess what I'd call that if we're talking about the same thing is an alternative to an SBA 504. Okay. Uh, for those of you who may be aware of the SBA's 504 program, that's for very large equipment or real estate acquisition or refinancing purposes. We do not compete with that, but there are certain requirements that must be met like 50% owner occupancy. And there may be other conditions where a borrower for whatever reason may not qualify. And in those circumstances, we'll take a look to match the existing bank's primary lending uh, amortization parameters and provide a five-year term loan with the same amortization as the bank, but two percentage points above the banks. Okay. Um, as far as uh, some of these new grant programs, I'm just getting tuned into what's happening. Um, you may see Larry Andrews, yeah. Aaron, okay. Larry's the one who's really, he and Neil Martin are working directly with Secretary Keneally's office. Um, and the governor directly and indirectly, primarily to make sure that the development of the program um, is as real time as possible in cooperation with the legislature, the governor, uh, the business needs. So in this, what I call quiet time for us until things begin to pick up again, probably in November, uh, we want to provide as much assistance to the small business community as we can. And that's why these grant programs are a way for us to, as an existing administrator, if you will, be up and ready to go to help administer those programs to the parties like the cities and towns and the businesses that need them. Um, you're welcome, Kevin or Peter, you're welcome to pipe in at any time. If there are certain attributes and stages of this program, these programs you'd like to proffer. I think you did a fine job. Let me just say that um, the team at Mass Growth Capital was tasked with putting 20 plus million dollars in very low, uh, small dollar loans on the street. And um, Chuck and his teammates did it in within uh, 10 days, uh, even a week maybe. It was Herculean and there was economic injury uh, loans that the Mass Growth Capital team put uh, right to work, soothing people's nerves. Now, some people have chosen not to utilize the money um, because the SBA then came along with some forgiveness, if you will, elements. So I just wanna say that Chuck and his team, are uh, they've reacted at the speed with which this pandemic has needed. That's, that's all I would add. Thank you. So he's earned his vacation this week, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, I'm, I'm glad he's got the endorsement, Peter. Um, and, you know, another question, well, this isn't even a question, really. This is kind of more of a statement. What I have experienced in talking to the businesses in Lexington, I think a lot of small business owners are so overwhelmed that they don't know where to start. Um, you know, that's, that's why we're having this panel, right? Because they have gone from, you know, I, I had a brick and mortar store myself. Um, fortunately, fortunately, or unfortunately, I let the business go before all of this happened. But 
I, I know the day to day running of the business takes all of your energy and then you throw this crisis on top of it and you've got financial problems, you have staffing problems, you have um, sanitization problems, customer relations problems, and it's all piled up at once. So what would you, and this is to all of you, I mean, what, what would you recommend businesses be doing or, or what programs do you think are being underutilized right now? Should I start? Sure. <laughs> since, uh, since I'm, the, I'm the only one that jumped forward. <laughs> so uh, one of the uh, programs that has been announced uh, throughout the uh, state, but it's really been focused on Boston and for no reason other than that's just where it, it has uh, gained a little steam. And I'm happy to share some information with, about this afterwards. It's, it's called the Small Business Strong uh, Program. It's been some leading institutions in Boston who are looking to provide um, technical assistance, consulting services to companies that are, as you stated, Aaron, a little, little bit overwhelmed right now. Uh, and, and, and there's there's no shame in that feeling right now because, you know, it started when, you know, gee, all right, we got to go home. When can we operate? Can we bring customers? How do we handle shipping? How do we, you know, the, the whole thing has been turned upside down and, you know, Unfortunately, the state has been, uh, we've been the entity that has done this, but it's really about managing a healthcare crisis, the pandemic itself. So Small Business Strong is a program that many of the larger companies, State Street, Fidelity, that's those types of companies, have put together a pool of money. And it, it, you know, it originally was uh, intended strictly for black and brown and women-owned businesses, but it's been relaxed a bit so that there's an opportunity for other companies. So I'll, I'll, I'll send some through you, Aaron, I'll send some information on this. And uh, I do think that's one of the big programs. It launched three weeks ago, and I think a lot of people have. And on the, one of the uh, calls that you referenced with Secretary Keneally, who's from Lexington, yeah. um, he mentioned this program and put it in his wrap up email, but I'll send it again separately to you so you can uh, circulate to your constituents. Yeah, thank you very much. Anybody have other programs they think people don't know about or haven't utilized enough yet? Well, I, 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 I just wanted to point out, I'm sorry, go ahead, Colin. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, real quick, just, I would, I would start with just asking, ask questions. Go, there, there are so many programs and not just financial programs. There's, there's programs out there like I'm also a score volunteer. There's programs like that where you can just talk to former business owners and executives just to see how they ran their businesses and what tripped them up and you know what they might have gone through a similar situation. Talk to your banker. They they well banks mainly focus on PPP. They know a lot of people in town. They know accountants that might be able to help you out. You know, just start asking the questions of to just find out what you don't might not even know. So that's just what I would say. Just ask anyone you know to, to see what they might have to say about it. Thanks, yeah. And, and, and the comment I was gonna add actually is, is almost redundant with, with Collins, and that is just reach out to any one of us. Uh, you know, Kelly had mentioned <laughs> Team Massachusetts, and you know, all of us will pull in our partners as appropriate. You know, if it's a question that we can't answer, um, or if it's an opportunity that is not in our wheelhouse, but is in one of our partner agencies' wheelhouse, we don't hesitate to bring each other in. We were on a call yesterday with, with Mass Development and Mass MEP, you know, and after that call, we then patched in um, uh, Mass Econ, who does site selection, those types of things. So, so we all work together, and it's pretty fluid, and we're, we're always happy to make the handoffs as appropriate, so. That's, really That's why they are called the Team Massachusetts. <laughs> so uh, I would I would suggest that uh, there's a list of programs, and definitely um, Lexington has been uh, developing, uh, kind of uh, curating all the all the things that have been happening and all the grant programs that are available. Some of them uh, the community can apply, and some of them the business owners have to apply by themselves. So there are different categories that need to be. So if you if you find some program which which you think might be applicable for you, I would definitely uh, suggest that you reach out to us, uh, to me or Casey, and we'll be uh, definitely 
try to get you more information or at least put you in touch with the right uh, resources in, um, in the state level. All right. So we do have a couple questions in the chat. The first one, uh, they're both EIDL questions. Um, is the EIDL fund still available to apply through SVA? My understanding is that there are still funds available, but I don't know for certain. And there are certain aspects. I think there's another question. If you get PPP money, um, is there a reduction or a net offset? I think it has to do with the $10,000 forgivable portion mm -hmm. of, or the $10,000 advance, as, they, as the SBA calls it. My best recommendation for particular SBA loan program questions would be um, there's some local SBA specialists uh, under Bob Nelson's group. Eli Spahu is um, a particularly good interface with the public at large, uh, especially small business folks. Obviously, they've been inundated with questions and there are constantly changes to these programs. But whether it's one day, two days, three days, or four days, you will get an answer from an SBA representative. And my recommendation is if there are specific questions that are related to SBA loans, that you try and contact uh, the sba.gov. And I think there, I don't know if it's forward slash, I think Boston and that group in particular would uh, probably know best certainly for this region in terms of particular questions. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Uh, let me just say that without, without question, there, EIDL is still available and any successful EIDL loan, which stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loan, we in government love acronyms, I'll, I'll try to not use them, but um, the, the program is still active and any successful SBA loan at a minimum, doesn't have to be serviced until January. So get some months, get some sales under your belt. <laughs> can, I, can I take a shot at the second one? Yeah, please. Will, will the EIDL funds, my business was given back to, given have to be deducted from the small P, payroll protection program money I have and, and I'm hoping to get forgiven. So the answer is yes. You, will, you won't be able to utilize both in that sense. But the good part is that PPP forgiveness, you know, with 60% uh, being payroll a minimum, is still in play for you. So that was to Richard Fields, but I don't think it's Richard Fields on the call. It's Kathy Fields. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Much prettier than Richard. <laughs> I actually had a, another PPP question. Um, this is really basic uh, for Colin. How, how does a business know whether they're eligible for the EZ form or if they need to go with the standard form? So this is another one where I would say the first thing you want to do is, is talk to like a CPA or your, your bookkeeper just to make sure. Um, the and look at the forms you, you'll know pretty quickly which one you're you're eligible for based on what kind of information you, it's asking you but i don't have a definite answer because we're still waiting for the final forgiveness rules for the, the the new law that came out to see if they're making any changes to these forms in most cases from what i understand as well um you'll be applying for forgiveness through your bank that you received the ppp loan from and that most banks may not actually even really utilize the SBA forms. There, a lot of banks are trying to set up online portals, things like that, or have kind of a one size fit all, fits all form. So if you enter, you answer one question one way, it'll take you to the, where you need to go for the next question too. It may not be the case in every situation, but that's where it seems a lot of the banks are going right now. Okay, that's, that is helpful. Kelly, I have a question for you. Um, so the new a new program that you that Mass Development just introduced, the Commonwealth Places. Mm -hmm. um, so so that is up to ten thousand, and then you need to have some partner uh, for the rest of the funding. Uh, now you have defined um, applications uh, have to be from a nonprofit 
or from uh, from a community so could you define us uh, what kind of projects are you looking forward to so this is a little bit out of what i do every day but i did try to look that up before um before this so let me just remind myself a little bit this is a little bit different than our normal Commonwealth places because typically for the last three years we've done a, it's sort of a crowdfunding where up to $50,000 a community uh, will present us with a project and let's just say it's a community garden and the project is going to be $30,000 and the, the community can commit to raising $15,000. So if they get to the $15,000 we match it with another fifteen. dollars and then that 30,000 is met. So this is a little bit different and $10,000 can be in the form of a grant to a community without a match from how I understand it, but it's to develop public spaces, whether it's outdoor seating and anything that is COVID related uh, that is gonna help the community be more user friendly in this new environment. So it's, it's brand new for us. It's talking about, um, you know, serving commercial districts uh, the, and if the eligible projects will comply with the uh, Commonwealth's reopening Massachusetts plan. So that's a good kind of hint of the things that are going to be most um, favorably looked at. Uh, so you can apply for up to $25,000, but you can apply for 10 without a match. Uh, so, but if the community thinks they can raise money, then you might as well apply for more if you have a bigger project. Um, we have one person in our um, organization, Peter, you may know her. She came to us from Worcester. Kevin, you may too, Amanda Gregoire. She's taken over the program. She's uh, really good. She's committed. Um, I am more than happy if anybody has <coughs> specific questions about how to make the best application. I, I can definitely set up a one-on-one -on -one with her because it's kind of the only thing she does, but it's, it's worth applying if there's something in town that people feel would be beneficial, but it really gets everyone involved. And the, the crowdfunding people, somebody may have $10 to donate, somebody may have you know 3000, but it's all about community buy-in. And then whatever region it's in, the team, like Mass Development is made up of teams in different regions of the state, we vote on the most beneficial projects. So we look and see what's come in. And I think the applications have already gone out. Did you submit one, Sandia? Not yet, but I'm trying to understand if uh, we can actually apply for an existing project. That I, I wouldn't know for certain, but I can certainly connect you directly with Amanda. Why don't you and I can talk about that offline and I'll, I'll connect you with her. That would be helpful, thank you. Sandia, yeah, I do know um, you and I have talked about this, obviously, the, um, the CDG, the community yes, block grant. Um, yes. Can you, can you speak about what that's intended for and, and what we're hoping to do with it? Yes. Uh, so the CDPG block grant, again, under the uh, mass growth capital, um, I believe, uh, is, is, uh, and, it, uh, and HUD, uh, we applied for that uh, particular program a um, couple of months ago, it's for micro enterprises, which means that any uh, any uh, organization or a business that has uh, anywhere between one to five employees or fewer uh, and uh, uh, is under LMI, which is, uh, you know, uh, they, they, their uh, income is a, a certain amount, uh, they can apply for these. And it can be uh, it can be applicable for uh, three or four uh, things. First and foremost is um, they can use it for rent purposes. They can use it for utilities. They can use it for um, maybe paying their employees. Uh, but again, it has to not um, as most of the federal fund. It's again a federal fund under the CARES Act. As most of the federal fund have restrictions uh, this cannot be applicable for things that they have already received ppp loan or any other loan from the cares act so we applied with other uh, 23 other communities uh, and application went through uh, by uh, via mapc and we're going to have uh, mass growth uh, administer the uh, the entire uh, funding for us so we are, we are hopeful that we receive it and we applied for hundred and twenty thousand dollars and uh, hopefully we'll have um, a lot of uh, small businesses apply for it. 
any small business uh, can apply for up to ten thousand dollars depending on the needs so that's one program but there's another program that the um, that we have applied recently that was last week is a shared streets and space program which is um kelly uh, which is you know in conjunction with kelly's program uh, mass developments commonwealth spaces program but that is run through the mass dot mass office of department of transportation um, that is specifically for any materials or anything related to COVID-19, wherein we can help businesses um, or change the way the streets are looking. But at the same time, these are like quick loans or quick grants, um, and they um, they have to be implemented within 15 to 30 days of uh, uh, of receiving the funding. So we applied for that, and we are still waiting to listen back uh, from MassDOT about our application. So several different things that we are applying through community, but I do know that uh, this team out here has a lot of other, uh, even if we are not applying for grants and loans directly, uh, as Chuck mentioned, and as Peter always mentioned, mentions, it's the resources that, that are important. You know, if, if we can actually um, tap on the resources that these guys have here, uh, it's fantastic. And uh, we can actually get to know more about what the state is rolling out. I know every day there's a new program that comes out every day, day there are so many different uh, rules and regulations that keep changing under the cares act and under the eidl and ppp uh, but having that uh, that communication door open for us uh, saying when yeah. we can go back and ask them questions that's more important at this point because not everyone understands everyone is trying to understand what covid 19 is <laughs> and at the same time how how these fundings can be actually applicable and uh, go forward with the funding. Aaron, can I put my marketing hat on for a second uh, for yeah, an MOBD yeah. program? Yeah. Great. So I just want to raise awareness of um, a, a third component of the Economic Development Incentive Program. And this was just uh, uh, enabled last year for the first time, and that is the Vacant Storefront Program, which is a fairly new program uh, that we would encourage uh, the municipality to, to apply for. And, and the way it works, it's not a lot of money. But uh, it's helpful to small businesses, and the municipality essentially applies to have a district approved where you identify parcels that have been vacant. Uh, it does not necessarily need to be contiguous. Uh, you then come to uh, one of our EACC quarterly meetings, get the district approved, and then after that meeting, um, any business that would that you know takes occupancy and signs a lease on on those can apply uh, for the grant. Uh, it does require a match from the municipality. Um, the Commonwealth will provide up to $10,000 refundable uh, tax credit for businesses that take advantage. Uh, we would hope that the municipality would match. And uh, just a, a point of note, the community development block grant monies can be used uh, for the community's match on this. So um, I just raise this now because um, on July 30th, Friday, July 30th at 10 a.m., um, MOBD will be holding a webinar uh, targeted for municipalities to better understand uh, the program. Just to give you, you know, a sense, uh, you know, it's been in effect for almost a year, and I think we've only had four awards to date. So we really are hoping to get a lot more activity for the program. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I actually, so that raises a question for me about um, landlords, right? I mean, we, Kelly, you have talked about capital for expansion and things like that. And in some ways it seems unthinkable that any businesses are expanding right now or, or taking over buildings or whatever, but certainly that must be going on. Are, can you speak to that? Well, I can speak to um, the activity at mass development. Uh, it seems that Project flow, while, you know, things went quiet and we did a lot of changes to existing projects as far as deferring loan payments, uh, the projects that were not open and losing money, there's an awful lot of development going on and there's a lot of savvy building owners and purchasers and developers that have used this last three to four months to really position themselves. And suddenly we are, I, I feel like if, if, you know, if I close my eyes, nothing's changed from this time last year. Hmm. Shovels are going in the ground, deals are getting done, requests are being made, 
uh, projects are happening. Um, housing projects are not stalling. Um, interesting, as a aside, I started the call talking about the stressful situation of looking for rental housing right now because of all the college students that have found themselves without dorm um, ability to be in dorms. So suddenly landlords in Worcester who were maybe getting $1,000 a month for a three bedroom can get $1,800 a month. So there's some pockets of real opportunity, especially Kevin around WPI um, and Clark. But so we're still seeing business going as usual, but we're out in the suburbs. I think things are different in the city and the densely populated areas and, and we've also talked to companies that are reconsidering one large office with thousands of people in one office versus regional offices several places across the Commonwealth. So it's different. And I think people are all figuring out their op options, but it's certainly not quiet, if that answers the question. No, it does. And yeah, that, that was what I was curious about. I think another question I have is what happens when these programs conclude you know we we did as colin said there was a another bill passed last week and signed extending some of the the deadlines and so forth but if if i were a business owner with these funds running out and time running out my question would be what's going what's going to be there for me when these programs conclude I'm well, putting all uh, of you on the spot. <laughs> Come on. So one thing I can speak to, it, one is be proactive. It, we don't know what's going to happen in the fall and the winter and things like that. So if you're on the fence, maybe start researching some of these loans and these programs and, and things like that to get them in place now. It, it, worst case is you don't have to use it because business stays good. And then you're, you, you have the funds set aside to pay back when it comes to lending programs. Um, there are, this time last year, there, there's always programs to help small businesses. The SBA is, is always, has been in existence with different programs to help. There, there's, there's programs for startup capital. There, there, there's always programs around that, that would help businesses maintain. There's traditional banking. Um, one of the, one of the things I've always said is don't apply for a, a line of credit with a bank when you need the money, because then you're going to have a little trouble getting it, apply for it six months before you need it. Then you have it in place when, um, mm -hmm. it's there. And we've seen it with some of our customers who had these things in place from last year that they, they were, they didn't really miss a beat with some of their business. So just be proactive with it, ask the questions, reach out about these different programs now. So that if you find yourself in a position in November where things are tight again, you're, you've already done the legwork on it. Aaron, I'd like to take a crack at that from a different angle. Please do. Um, oftentimes we're asked uh, to restore lost working capital. This is, I'm speaking historically, not current environment. And usually what that meant was oftentimes, um, the business model had been successful and management or ownership had not been challenged so that when great new technologies or methodologies were developed, not so much by competitors, but by the world in the marketplace itself, because they had not challenged themselves in terms of a never ending search for how can I modify my business model? How can I pivot? Um, they were caught off guard. When they come back after usually assistance with consulting to rethink their business model, largely due to psychological entrenchment to the historical model, that's when we've been instrumental as a lender. So my advice to any business operator would be if you can schedule a certain amount of time every week and dedicate yourself to rethinking your business model, just imagine it in different ways and say to yourself, 
what happens if I can't deliver? What happens if I have to close down? What happens if I'm restricted as to the quantity of customers that can visit my site? How else can I deliver my unique quality or nature of products and services and how the customer perceives them? How can I do it differently to assure its continued viability? And it's not just a matter of challenge the challenging folks to think differently. Here's another resource. The Massachusetts Small Business Development Center networks have very experienced and talented advisors that along with SCORE folks that have been previously mentioned would be thrilled to help business owners rethink, re-engineer, reimagine their business models. No, that's really helpful. That, that's very helpful. Thanks, Chuck. Do we have other questions? I don't want to cut anybody off. Um, Sandhya, did you have any other questions? So, Peter and Kevin, I um, especially Kevin, I wanted to um, learn from other um, other communities as well. You know, we don't get that much opportunity to learn from other communities. And Kevin, uh, for you, with Booster and that region, and Peter uh, for for Central, and I, I think you have um, a lot of network as far as you know what other communities have been doing. Any any advice for Lexington that we need to um, uh, you know take forward and uh, up, apply here um, during this pandemic? I'll defer to the senior uh, director of the MOPD for this one. <laughs> well, I mean, this is going to sound like a planted question to the rest of you on this call, but if, if and when something new comes up, we're going to make sure Sandia knows about this. So I think you guys are, are moving and trending in the right direction. <clears throat> the, the, um, the joint grant application that you applied for with um, MAPC, by the way, my hometown is, is a part of that. And uh, I think it's very forward thinking to be getting ahead of that right there. So I, I don't really, I don't have anything off the top of my head, Sandia. I wanted to see if Kevin had any thoughts related to Worcester. But you guys have, you've been, and, and this is a big part of the Middlesex Three as well. So the, the, the group that you guys belong to. But through the um, conversations there, you were prepared for outside dining. You've been prepared for what was then phase two, you were ahead of the curve. And I, I just, I think that you're doing what you need to do. My I, I question was, other, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, I think the other thing is, uh, one thing that's positive that's come <laughs> out of the pandemic, I think is the willingness of communities to work together on things. Uh, you know, a month and a half, two months ago, uh, Worcester put together a pretty novel program to do some micro grants and make them available. And a lot of communities read about it in the paper and said, geez, you know, how, how can we do that? And rather than reinvent the wheel, uh, the then deputy uh, development director, now, you know, chief development officer, uh, was willing to field calls from other communities uh, to answer how they did this, where the money came from, how they administered it, gave them the forms and everything else. So, um, you know, just reach out, you know, because I, I think everyone has a spirit of let's work together and, and help each other through this and let's not reinvent the wheel when we don't have to. Mm -hmm. I would just jump in and this is, I'm out of my lane. This is more Peter and Kevin, but the community compact, I would think that there's just loads of good information. I know that in order to get those awards, communities had to put forth best practices, publish those best practices, share those with other communities. I would be digging into there to see what other uh, communities are doing. And I don't look at it often, but Peter and Kevin might know more about that than I do. I mean, I think that the town did uh, participate in the community contact. Um, I don't recall, I don't recall what you had asked for, for assistance, whether it was financial modeling or what have you, but economic development, I can't recall. And um, that one would go back uh, to Melissa Tentaculous. I, I don't know what you guys find. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah, because the thing is, um, more as Kevin mentioned, you know, it's it's learning from other communities and uh, not inventing the wheel again. A lot of these uh, these programs have been existing for a long time, 
the only thing is uh, people have been thinking innovatively at this point that's how i feel um, that a lot of these programs uh, even um, peter you mentioned about global last time during our call on um, m3 region that how global already applied for the mass dot grant before they have opened the grant and um, how they they utilized uh, the the jersey barriers um, um, to start thinking about things like that and i think that that's helpful to bring into this uh, this group as well to, uh, for the businesses because you know uh, think about how you can utilize the current opportunities and space and um, maybe bring more customers as chuck mentioned and how to develop uh, and we are here um, and uh, the chamber is here to listen to your ideas and um, your uh, you know business model and if we can be of help we will be certainly uh, try to get you the best resources that are available out there absolutely well with that then i want to thank everybody for participating today and for reinforcing that you are accessible and that you know there are there are people on the other end of the phone if, if we can get over the fear of picking up the phone you guys are there and and you have answers and that's really heartening to know um, so thank you again and I Sandia prompted me at the very beginning to begin recording which I had totally forgotten to do so I think we missed like the first two minutes but um, I do have the recording for this. It'll be available um, on our website and, and our YouTube channel and so forth. Um, and oh, and there's a question in the chat about posting all the links. Yes, um, in, several of you mentioned having you know a short presentation or some some links to resources. I will absolutely put that together and make that available as well. So, thank you very very much. Thanks for having us, Aaron. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Big Thank shout you. out to uh, to my team, um, mass team, uh, for agreeing to do this like yeah, in you. a really short notice. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you.